Greetings and salutations, my wonderful watchers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Overanalyzes. The Mando hates droids. It makes no sense that he would let the droid pilot his ship in The Prisoner, the sixth episode of The Mandalorian. Alright, today I want to look at one of the more subtle aspects of the character development the creators are putting into The Mandalorian. Specifically, one of three virtues that they're giving him that make him a hero. In this episode six, the develop this development comes to a very visible head in the Mando letting the droid Zero pilot his ship. Now I have seen a lot of comments, like the one that I started out this video with, to the effect that this scene came out of nowhere, that it was confusing, that it was completely out of character for the Mando to let a stinking clanker lay a servo on his precious ship. Those comments rather surprised me, because from my perspective, this character growth had been progressing gradually and rather obviously throughout the show. Well, as gradually as possible when you only have six 30-odd minute episodes each to advance it in. But that scene seemed to me to be the next logical step of his character growth. Why did it irritate so many fans of the show? After pondering this for a while, I came to the conclusion that it boils down to what exactly type of character that Mando is, and the fact that the genres of horse girl and science fiction don't exactly overlap as much as they do in the general fandom as they do in my personal circle of nerdy girls. The Mando as a character is one that we as a modern audience are not used to seeing in cinema, big screen or small, or even on the stage really. This is something of a feature of the character and a feature of the visual mediums. In fact, off the top of my head, I can only think of one common use of this character trope in visual media, aside from one very notable exception, which we'll get to later. The only time we see this character that the Mando is in common media is the father of the horse girl in the horse girl movies. You know, there's a new one out every year, the girl and her horse, etc. and so on. And you know this character. He does love deeply, he cares deeply, but it is not something that shows visually. The face of the character is like some deep fathomless pool. Even with deep and powerful current surging underneath, nothing shows on the surface. Now in the girl and her horse narrative, discovering the depths of his personality, of his feeling, is part of her character development, making him just a secondary character. And that really means that there really is no common trope that makes this character the primary character in modern cinema. Depending on how good the writing is, this lack of visible emotion is either treated as a character flaw or simply a character element. Some acknowledge that there are people who do not show their hearts on their sleeves. That's just who they are. That is why the discovery by the daughter is so meaningful. She comes to understand that her father's feelings for her do show, but they show in ways that it's hard for her young, demonstrative heart to grasp. He takes the time every morning to make her hash browns crisp and perfect just the way she likes them. He checks the straps on her saddle every time before she rides out. He sits waiting up on the porch far into the wee hours to make sure she got the horse back in the stable safe. He cares, he loves, he fears, but nothing of that shows on his face. He will be undergoing his secondary character arc as well during this time, probably learning to show himself a little more demonstratively so that his daughter can see it. But again, that's all secondary to her character development, her discovery of his depths. This trope is far more common for men and women both in written fiction, where the ever so handy omniscient third person lets you see into both heads. In the classic children's book, Bob, Son of Battle, the main father character expresses his deep grief over the loss of his wife by simply not entering the titular character Bob in a sheep herding competition the next spring. Meanwhile, the village around him is unable to see any sign of his grief in his face. Given the time and setting, they understand it's a harsh life in this village. They understand this character. But the book makes a point of it. It doesn't show. In A Girl of the Limberlost, the mother has been scarred men mentally and emotionally and is trapped in a state of constant grief that does not allow her to show her feelings towards her daughter in any emotionally overt way. But the daughter 
is wise enough to notice that she's always very well fed and her mother goes out of her way to make things nice and comfortable for her in ways she really doesn't have to. Then there is the one very obvious example of this trope that shows up in visual in visual storytelling, Batman. He's perhaps the most obvious example of this. There's no doubt that he loves his friends and family deeply, but almost never expresses that in any traditional emotional manner. This has changed. Uh, emo emotive displays have become more common with modern authors, but still this Batman character is the trope that the creators are going for with the Mando. This is the kind of character that the Mandalorian is. He, he literally cannot show his emotions in this sense. The helmet makes sure of that. Everything must be expressed through his actions. He, we learn that he cares deeply about foundlings in general because he's willing to put off his, the attainment of his own Beskar armor to provide for him, even when he brings in the biggest hull of Beskar that his covert has possibly ever seen. He has affection for Baby Yoda from the very first episode and kind of respect for him as a living creature. And this is best illustrated by the image of his literally handing a part of his ship to the tyke. The ship that's his life, his way of making money. And we will come back to this. It is very important to the main point, which is that him handing over the controls of the Razor Crest to a droid was a logical step in his character development, not something completely out of the blue. He respects Cara Dune as a fellow warrior, as shown by his willingness to leave the planet at first, and then his decision to include her in the housing for shooting agreement with the village. He has shown a general respect for life in trying to let the Republic Guard live, and letting Dr. Pershing live, and leaving the people who betrayed him alive. But those are his good qualities. Let's take a little peek under the darker side of that helmet. His negative emotions. He shows that he can and will kill without pause if he deems it necessary to his goals. He shows no sympathy or mercy for his bounties until we get to Baby Yoda. And here we get to the point again. I told you, I'd get there. He shows that he despises droids. He despises them enough to waste money simply to avoid them when money is tight for him. He despises them enough to waste time in getting his ship repaired on Tatooine. He despises them enough to put his own life and safety at risk by flying around in a half-repaired ship. But, going back to his positive qualities, he loves Baby Yoda, and over the last five episodes he has been growing. That has been changing him as a character, th this response to having Little Green Bean in his cockpit. First and foremost, he gave up his place in the Bounty Hunter's Guild. He risked his life to rescue him from the imps. He devotes his time and effort to caring for baby Yoda, and like the character trope he is, he does it all without any visible angst. When the horse girl dad finally agrees to put his little baby girl up on the half-tame stallion for the big competition, he doesn't whine and whimper over it, he just offers up his hands and hefts her into the saddle, even though you know he is terrified and panicking. This character endures the situation with grim fortitude. He is the embodiment of the old prayer, give me the courage to change what I can, the patience to endure what I cannot, and the wisdom to tell the difference. And I think this is where this virtue of wisdom is coming in, in the sixth chapter. The Mando has already displayed great courage, and already displayed patient endurance in having to endure what he cannot. The Mando... <clears throat> The Mando displayed great courage in rescuing Baby Yoda from the Imps, and he displayed the wisdom to know that he had no other babysitter, and in to endure it quietly. He either had to bring Baby Yoda with him in each situation, or leave him on the Razor Crest alone. He made one choice in Sanctuary, and another choice in the Gunslinger. When he had discovered that Pele would be a babysitter, he accepted it as he had everything else, wordlessly. Almost. Then he stopped and he showed his character growth by thanking her verbally. Because of Baby Yoda, because of the love he carries for his child, he is changing, growing, but it is only ever shown in his actions. He doesn't angst over it. In that same episode, he is shown swallowing his pride and taking a non-guild's job to get money. In the real world, men who are fathers work far more hours, statistically, play less than men who aren't. Here we see the Mando sacrificing his time and his pride, and then risking his life on a job he clearly wouldn't have taken otherwise to provide for Baby Yoda. 
But he's still clinging to the, his hatred of his droids, and he pays for it. He has a very limited time on Tatooine and has to haul out of there at the end of the episode. And in that time, Paley wasn't able to fix his ship completely. He forced himself into a position where he, and far more importantly to him, Baby Yoda, are in a dangerous need of resources through his pride and his hate. If he had let Paley's droids work on his ship, he might not have had to go to his shadiest contact for money. He knows this. And once Zero states this, after running his diagnostic, we the audience know it. And given that he has sacrificed everything else up to this point for Baby Yoda, it comes as no surprise, at least to me, that he was willing to choke down his gall and sacrifice his hatred of droids. In a mirror of him putting the knob in Baby Yoda's hands to keep him happy, he put the raiders of crest in Zero's hand servos to keep them safe. And there is the other thing. He had to do this job to get money. He had to bring Baby Yoda along because he had no baby sister. Ba he wants Baby Yoda to be as safe as possible. It will be safer for everyone concerned if Zero is driving. Therefore, he sacrifices his pride, again, to keep Baby Yoda safe. This is the classic arc for this character, the father sacrificing everything he has so that the child can have a better life. So no, I don't think that there was anything out of character in the Mando handing over the control of the ship to Zero. But what do you think? Am I wrong? Was this completely out of character? Was it too soon? Is the fact that I am underneath my proud geek covering a shameless horse girl clouding my judgment? If you like this video, give, give a like and share below, or even better, leave a comment picking my analysis apart. Peace out, my wonderful watchers, and remember to go hug the stoic in your life.